In this video, I'm going to talk about mapping and data journalism. I'm going to talk about the role of critical cartography, um, some issues to bear in mind as a data journalist when you're using mapping, some tools and tips for making maps, and we're going to look at lots of examples along the way. Before we do that, it's well worth watching um, the video in these slides from the West Wing um, about maps and a, a particular scene where some people come to talk about the proposal of changing the maps that are used. It's, it explains better than I possibly could and much more amusingly than I could some of the themes that I'm going to talk about in this video. Um, what I want to start by talking about in this video is this idea of critical cartography. As mapping technology has become available to more and more people, um, it's been used to draw attention to the way in which maps are used as an instrument of power. As journalists, obviously, we're always interested in how power is exercised and we are supposed to be holding power to account. So this is particularly important for us to understand when we come to use maps ourselves. What we need to think about as data journalists is how we are exercising the power that maps have and also whether we may be complicit in the way that power is exercised through maps. We must recognise that we are also agents of power. So critical cartography is a large part of this and Theo Kandinis who writes on uh, crime mapping and critical cartography is particularly useful to read on this. One example of drawing attention to the way that mapping shapes our perception of the world is this surrealist map of the world from 1929. And it, it really illustrates how maps are editorial choices in the same way as the words that we use to tell stories or indeed the information that we choose to include. Um, in this map, we have the Pacific Ocean in the center of the map rather than Europe, which we would be used to. We can also see that Africa is very small and Europe and the UK even smaller. So it's distorting our perception, or at least it's giving us a different perception of things, simply through making different editorial choices about where the map is centered and how perspective is used. Um, also related to this is the idea of the cartographic gaze. This is the idea that maps can have the potential to dehumanize what they portray. This is an issue that we face as data journalists more broadly anyway when we're dealing with statistics and numbers. How do we make sure that we can tell the stories about those uh, data in a way that doesn't detract from the human impact of them? How do we make sure that people are still at the centre of our stories? And in mapping, this is um, explicitly recognised in this term, the cartographic gaze. Are we just rendering the complexity of human life as mere dots? How do we address that potential weakness or issue in the map? For example, this story on banned zones in London where people can be punished for activities that would be otherwise legal, it draws a number of shapes on the landscape of London, it uses colouring, but we don't have any sense of the human dimension here of who's affected um, what they're like, what the effects are. The other thing about mapping is that in order to map data, the data must relate to physical events with a geographical um, property. So we often will need data that has, for example, latitude and longitude, or perhaps some sort of region in which it took place. This creates a problem for us when we're dealing with a topic where not all the data has a geographical presence. Crime is a particularly good example of this because some types of crime don't have a physical space. Cybercrime is perhaps a very obvious example, but also financial crime, fraud, and other types of crime often don't have a specific physical space. So when we map crime, what we're actually doing is mapping a certain dimension of crime, a certain type of crime, and we're, we're leaving out other types of crime. So we risk misrepresenting the nature of the issue that we're trying to tell a story about. Now, crime is just a particularly good example, but obviously other topics will have the same potential weaknesses. So if you are mapping any sort of issue, it's always worth considering what 
information is missing from this, what events may not have a geographical point, or at least one that's recorded. Um, the other thing to consider is the nature of geography. This is um, a, a really interesting project which is well worth exploring um, independently. It's called Stories Behind a Line and it's about the routes that immigrants have taken to um, get into Europe. And it focuses on a handful of stories, so it's trying to move away from the big numbers, the abstract uh, figures, and to tell a more specific human story. But I think there are a number of issues with this which really illustrate some of the potential dangers in mapping. One uh, issue, for example, is that there are no images of the people involved, and that there are probably very good reasons for that, but it also causes a problem in terms of humanising these people. It's presented very elegantly, very simply, very stripped back, which is very effective in an aesthetic sense, and it did draw a lot of attention to it as a piece of art. And it's important to emphasise that this is a piece of art, it's not a piece of journalism. But one thing that the lines in this map draw attention to, or at least make me think about as a journalist, is actually these lines hide the complexity and variety of the journeys involved. Walking across a part of Africa is very different to taking a train across Italy, for example. So the different parts of this journey are not all equal. It takes a lot longer to make one journey, it might be more dangerous, it might be more difficult than a different part of the journey. And that's something we should always consider in the way that we treat maps. Not all spaces are the same, but maps can have that effect. The other thing about maps is obviously they can be misused. There are a couple of examples here of maps being used as propaganda or um, to spread fake information. The image on the left, for example, was a, a map that was being widely circulated in Germany a few years ago about refugee crime. Now, the makers of that map actually decided to classify as refugee crime any criminal event, uh, any report of a criminal event, which involved a description of someone having some sort of dark skin. Now, some of those crimes involved the person with darker skin actually was the victim rather than the perpetrator, but they still counted that. There was no record in the data about whether the person was a refugee or an immigrant or anything else for that matter. Um, this was just a massive assumption made by the creators of the map. So they can be misused in many ways and, and the classification of data is a key part of that. And it's one thing we need to be cautious of and watch out for as journalists as these tools are obviously accessible to many, many more people. Let's move on to those tools now then and the process of making maps. Broadly speaking, there are two reasons why you should be making a map as a journalist. The first reason is that you want to show some sort of distribution. The map serves the purpose of showing clusters, of showing variation, postcode lotteries that we've discussed before, so um, different parts of a country having different access to certain um, services, for example. Or they might simply show the state of a nation in some way. The second way that we might um, choose to use a map is to allow the user to explore space. So the most common example would be to put things on a map and allow people to explore events near me. A common example would be food hygiene inspections. We can put food hygiene inspections on a map and the reader then can choose to look at restaurants near where they live and their um, inspections or restaurants that they visited in the past. It allows people to create a more personal story. There are a number of different types of maps to consider as well. The most common and the ones that you have probably seen are the choropleth map and the dot density map. A dot density map simply places a dot on a map for every event. So if we were dealing with crime, we would have a dot for every crime that occurred, placed at the um, location where that crime took place. A choropleth map deals more with aggregate figures. So um, in this case, it would be the uh, number of events in a particular region. That region could be 
a constituency or a police authority or a health authority or some other administrative body where they have a particular border that they operate within. So all of these are obviously US states and in the Choropleth map we have each US state coloured in a different intensity depending on the value that it represents. So that could be the number of crimes, it could be the amount of pollution that's created, it could be the number of people with a particular disease or on a waiting list and so on. That's the Choropleth map. Some other types here as well to consider though include the proportional symbol map. Um, this is where instead of placing multiple dots, we might place one dot on one space and then size it based on a value. So again, using crime as an example, there were 17 crimes at this location. So we're gonna have a, a dot or a, a circle or a square that's sized proportionally to that number. Sometimes it's placed in the capital or central point of a region, so it could represent the whole region. And, and that can be a little bit misleading in that case, and I would probably recommend a choropleth map instead if that's the case. A cartogram uh, actually sizes areas based on a, on a value. So instead of leaving the area as the size as it is in geography, we change the size of that area, we shrink it or enlarge it based on a particular value. So in, initially, essentially, this is like a choropleth, but instead of using color to indicate um, the, the size of a value, we're using size, relative size. A density map is like a dot density map, but instead of showing the um, individual points, we just show a kind of a, a, a blurry point that's often called a heat map. And the reason for this is that sometimes we, want, we might want to want show density, but we don't want to be able to, we don't want to show the specific locations. Uh, for example, where privacy is an issue. There was a, a case a few years ago where someone made a map of gun permits. And um, the intention of the story was to communicate um, where people tended to uh, own guns in a city. The problem with this was that it was very specific. You could see the specific locations of those owners of guns and people took uh, issue with this for a number of reasons. But that specificity wasn't required. We did not need to know the specific locations of those go gun owners. We just needed to know the density. So a heat map, a density map is a way of doing that without showing the specific locations. And then we also have flow maps. This is to show routes, um, so the number of journeys taken between two points, for example, or even relationships or financial transactions between two locations. Now, one other map I want to mention as well, which has uh, enjoyed a, a period of popularity a few years ago, is the hedgehog map. Um, this is essentially the same as a um, the proportional symbol map. So what we're doing here is we're placing a symbol in different locations and we are changing it, a property of that symbol, proportional to a particular value. So in other words, the symbol here is an arrow and the arrow is being placed in different locations and it's being sized based on, in most of these examples, political swing. So the, the change in votes from um, Republican to Democrat or Conservative to Labour and vice versa. So we have colour used to indicate which way the vote swung and we also have um, direction and we have size, uh, length to indicate the amount by which it swung. So that's a hedgehog map. And then we can also think about routes. Um, this is not strictly speaking a map. This is a, a kind of an abstract map essentially. And we're not going to use mapping tools to create them probably. But it's worth mentioning as another form of map to consider, particularly if you're dealing with geography and you're thinking of geography as some sort of vehicle for the story. So in this case, and, and there are similar examples, a route has been picked and used as a as a vehicle for a story. So we're looking at something, let's say poverty in a city, 
we're going to pick a route across that city and use that to tell the story of how poverty varies across that city. At the bottom there you can see a line chart which is showing the values as they change across that route, the different parts of the route, the different locations. So that can be quite effective as a way of telling a story as well. Now in terms of tools, there are lots of tools that allow you to create maps. A few that I'm going to mention um, are Data Wrapper and Flourish, which are good introductory tools for creating maps. A lot of them, uh, both of these have uh, maps built in for places like the UK and regions uh, and constituencies, things like that. Tableau also allows you to create maps. And then there's the tool StoryMap.js, which allows you to create a, a sequence, a journey across different points on a map. QGIS is a much more powerful mapping tool, um, so that has a steeper learning curve, but it allows you to do a lot more. And then there are some um, packages in programming languages like JavaScript and R, particularly Leaflet, which allow you to create maps using coding. And if you want to do some of the more ambitious maps, then that's probably the direction you might have to go in. Now, when you come to create the maps, it's worth bearing in mind Ben Schneiderman's visual information seeking mantra, which is overview first, zoom and filter, then details on demand. A map is quite often a, a piece of interaction design and it has this kind of free stage nature to it. So in a points map, you have an overview to begin with. The user has an overview of all the points. They can then zoom in to a particular area on that map and then click on a point to get more details on demand. Now, when you're making a points map, you need to consider those three elements. You need to consider the overview and you need to consider the detail at the end, so the, the detail labels that will pop up when someone clicks on a window, what's going to be in there. Choropleth maps work the same way. You have the overview, you might zoom into a particular area and then click on it to get some more details. Now when you write those information windows, it's worth writing them as a story rather than just a list of facts. So in the top left, you can see an example of where someone has just put um, the information as a series of, of pieces of data, um, the borough, the number of thefts and the value of items. But in the bottom example, you can see where that uh, similar information has been written in, into a more natural sentence. So we've got a number of criminal offences were dealt with by this police force, there were this many violent crimes and so on to try to use natural language in the way that you write your information windows. Now, when you come to mapping, we've talked about exploratory um, stories and uh, also stories that show patterns, but also it's worth pointing out that you shouldn't create a map simply because the data is geographical. You must be telling a story. This, for example, is um, a story about very similar data to the Iraq war logs that I showed earlier. So it's the same as this data of um, deaths caused in Iraq. But it's not been shown on a map. And that's because the story doesn't have to be geographical. In this case, the story on the left is about the different proportions of, of types of casualties. So what proportion of casualties were enemies, what proportion was friendly fire, what, which proportion was civilians. The orange slice there is the civilians, so we can see a very different story to that map. We can see a story about the composition of the casualties involved. The chart on the right is the same data but presented in chronological order. So the top of the chart is the start of the conflict and then the bottom is uh, the most recent events. So we can see at the start of a conflict there is a lot of grey, that's enemy deaths or enemy casualties. And then towards the middle it gets a lot more orange. So we've got a sense of change and change over time, changing composition over time. Again, no need for a map. Another example of a story using similar data from the Washington Post um, turns every pixel of that chart into a human story with a photo. So we get a sense of the scale, 
but it's exploratory and it's trying to humanize the different events represented by that data. Some more examples where journalists have decided not to use a map come from the FT. This is uh, an example on the left of a map that was not used to show um, some issues with banking and, and where banks might move. And um, the chart on the right is what they actually decided to use instead because it much more effectively allowed people to compare who was in which um, cities. And when it comes to the US election, We've talked about um, choropleth maps, but actually a simple table of results has been found to be much more effective in allowing people to find out the results. Now that takes us on to cartograms, and in particular tile grid cartograms, and elections are a great illustration of this. Um, in the upper left is a choropleth map of the US, and it shows how different areas of the US voted in an election. And this map was being widely shared um, last year because people were arguing, look how red the US is. You know, uh, this was obviously shared by Trump supporters who wanted to argue that there was overwhelming support for Donald Trump. And indeed, that map does appear to show an enormous amount of um, Republican voters in the country. The problem is it doesn't show people, it shows space. It shows um, different parts of the country based on the amount of land that those different parts occupy. But an area that's very rural and has very few people is not the same as an area which is metropolitan and where the population is much more dense and more concentrated. And that's the problem with these types of maps, with choropleth maps. If you're trying to show something about people rather than space, then a choropleth map might not be doing that particularly effectively. And the GIF in the lower right corner was one person's illustration of the difference between the two ways of looking at the same data. So the GIF shows a transition from the map, the choropleth map, to um, what would be called a, a cartogram, essentially, where you're sizing areas based on the number of votes or the number of people. And there's been a number of attempts to address this problem. Um, in the upper left, you've got the, if you like, traditional US election map, the US states map, rather, uh, where we're seeing states based on the amount of space that they occupy. And then the other three maps are attempts to show the same um, map, if you like, but based on the amount of people or the amount of votes or the amount of electoral college votes, the amount of um, the, the power, if you like, that those states have to elect a president at the end of the election. And so you can see these are very different effects, different uh, attempts, in some cases uh, superimposed on an outline of the US, in some cases trying to position the different um, parts uh, relative to where they would be in the real US. But they much more effectively communicate the real um, number of people, number of votes in those areas. And here's another example from Bloomberg. In this case, they've left space between the different shapes in order to leave them where they need to be compared to the original map. In the UK, obviously, the same thing has happened. Um, these are tile grid cartograms again. And in this case, we're not looking at, at tiles based on the number of people exactly, but based on constituencies. So we have the same situation in the UK. Um, when you see election results on election night, if it's on a normal map, then London, which has a lot of people but is very densely populated, actually isn't very easy to see compared to Scotland, which is very um, sparsely populated. These cartograms give a square or a hexagon or a particular shape to each constituency because each constituency returns one MP. So although different constituencies might have different numbers of people, they're broadly similar and also ultimately, even if they do have different numbers of people, they are voting for an MP that gets one vote. So essentially each constituency gets one vote in the House of Commons and that's what this is representing. 
So we can see that Scotland becomes much smaller because it represents fewer people and has fewer constituencies, likewise Wales, whereas London becomes much larger on this map because London has more people than Scotland, for example. It's well worth watching this video by Vox, which is again in the slides, which explains this issue in more detail as well. So just to draw up the key points, the first thing to remember when you're mapping any data is that the map is not the same as the territory. It is always going to be an editorial decision about a representation of a form of reality. So that means that um, the choice of of the projection of the map, for example, has an influence. Um, the uh, choice of whether you use a choropleth map or a points map or a different type of map, that will be an editorial decision that will affect the story that you tell and how accurately it represents the facts. Also, don't map just because data is geographical. Use a map because you're trying to tell a story about clustering or you're trying to allow people to explore information and actually a map does that very well. There are lots of examples where sometimes a map isn't the most effective way to tell the story that you're trying to tell. And finally, always consider what is not geographical, what doesn't have a physical space when you're using maps, what is invisible from the story and perhaps should be in that story. If you want to explore this further in the repo on GitHub, um, you'll find a number of different guides and tutorials to creating maps in both Data Wrapper and Flourish. Um, so I'll have a play with those and I'll see you in class.